Today on Locked On Red Wings, we're going to recap those two games that happened over the weekend. But man, Lucas Raymond, he broke out last year, but is this going to be a breakout year? Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for WWJ News Radio 950, while Scotty is a freelance journalist for the Detroit News as well as the host of Locked On Tigers. And Scotty, this weekend, the Red Wings played two preseason games. They played at home against the Washington Capitals, got blanked two to nothing, um, then went on the road, then very next night to Chicago, the United Center, and blanked the Chicago Blackhawks three to nothing and absolutely dominated. So, as you guys can probably expect, we want to mostly talk about the game they won, but we will start off talking about the game they lost well, two to nothing against the Washington Capitals. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's also just tough because any of the like it's no longer the most recent game. Like any of the the problems or critiques we have, which we will get to in the Capitals game, if they fix them against the Hawks, right? It's like. Okay, well, like, clearly they did it. They, like, figured it out and they fixed it. So, like, how much are we, you know, how much are we going to be able to, uh, I don't know, complain or, like, find... I mean, we can complain as much as we want. Ways sure we can find things. Right, I guess. <laughs> like, find ways to, like, nitpick certain players and stuff when, you know, if they fixed it. There is a few things that, like, I thought they did poorly on Friday that they did well on Saturday. So, like, I don't know. It's just not as much of a discussion point to not do the most recent game for positives and negatives. Yeah, I mean, so they, they lost two to nothing, and we were talking a little bit before the episode, and you thought you saw a lot of dump and chasing in that Washington game that obviously was addressed, and they're, they're, they're breaking, and we'll talk about it in the second half of the episode, but they were crossing that blue line beautifully in that game against the Blackhawks. But, I mean, if you want to point out to players that did play well in that game, obviously, Billy Huso stands out. The Washington Capitals were outplaying the Detroit Red Wings all game in that two to nothing loss against the Washington Capitals. Billy Huso did not let in a single goal in that game. In fact, uh, I believe he faced th- he faced 13 shots, made 13 saves. Victor Bradstrom came in, faced 17 shots, allowed one against. So that second goal, obviously, you know, is what it is. But, I mean, they, they both played fine. But Vili Husso, I mean, that was a great game to see, especially when followed up by, you know, that was following Alex Nedeljkovic's not so, a little bit more shaky game before that. Obviously, Nedeljkovic looked great against the Blackhawks, but... You know, for the purposes of that game in that moment in time, it was reassuring to see, oh, Huso's coming out and playing really well when the Red Wings were getting outplayed. I mean, if you look at shots, they were outshot in every single period. They were out Corsi. They were out Fenwick. They were out every every metric you can use to talk about possession. The Capitals dominated every single period. So the goalies playing as well as they did, especially Villa Huso, who's going to be on the NHL roster, that was reassuring to see. Yeah, I thought he looked really good, and I, I thought that, um, the defense in front of him looked really solid too. There was a lot. I, Edvinson specifically, I, I, I thought had a pretty good game in, in this one and like got some shots off, got some opportunities, but also one of my big r- things that I highlighted in the first couple of games in the preseason with Edvinson. And I mean, even going back to, to whatever prospect red and white games, et cetera, was, you know, we talked about maybe the aggressiveness and, and just how, you know, skating with intent, finishing hits, et cetera, and just like how important that aggressiveness is for everyone, but especially defensemen. Like that's a that's a vital part to that style of play and the way that he plays, you know, at the blue line. And, and so I, I thought that this game was much better in that regard. I thought that he looked way more aggressive. I thought – uh, everything out there looked like it had way more intent. I didn't think he was as shaky, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think there might have just been some early preseason, I don't know, nerves. And, you know, we still have some preseason games left. We haven't even gotten to the regular season. Who knows where he's going to start? We, we still have a, a long road to go. I'm not trying to say that, oh, you know, he looked good for one game, I thought, and so it's just done and he's here. Like, no, that's not how progression and development works. It's not, it's not always linear, but – for this game, I thought that this was the first time that I really thought he looked 
confident, honestly, out on the ice and playing with all these dudes. And I think that that's something that we absolutely shouldn't overlook. I, I thought he was way more aggressive, way more physical. And uh, yeah, I, I, in a game that did not have a whole lot of, you know, highlights for the Red Wings, uh, really for either team, I, I thought that he was definitely one that I circled as had a great game. And then, yeah, like you said, who's so really in the shots that he did face uh did really well against them and I, I think he's already ready already ready yeah that's the that's right it sounded weird out of my mouth that is correct <laughs> already ready um for, for the regular season i'm really pumped about this goalie room yeah absolutely i mean then you follow it up with how nadelkovich played in the next night and obviously you know they they weren't as challenged in the offensively or defensively i should say in the game against the blackhawks they only faced, I think, nine shots through two periods. But Nadelkovic got yep. to play all two those first two periods. Kosa only played the third. And Nadelkovic looked a lot more solid. He looked a lot like the first game, kind of like with uh, Tristan Yari of the Pittsburgh Penguins. That first preseason yep. game, he looked rough. But, I mean, it's the first for a reason. It's just a preseason game. And so, you know, it, it's it's important to highlight when players do well. But, you know, preseason is the perfect time to, like, give excuses if someone plays like crap. Just be like, ah, it's just the preseason and nothing matters. But when someone plays really well, like it's, you know, give them credit, you know, whatever fits your narrative. And, uh, you know, Michael Rasmussen is a guy who fits my narrative because in the game, in the two nothing loss, he played really well. I mean, every single possession metric that there is says that he was good. He had an expected goals for percentage of 70% in that game, which means 20% more sh quality shot attempts for when he was on the ice than he wasn't. And then relative to his teammates, he was 40% better. So the team got 40% more quality shot attempts when he was on the ice rather than off the ice. So, I mean, Michael Rasmussen is really, 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 you know, campaigning for that center role. And I am uh, all for it because I, I was saying all along, I was saying all along, baby, 4C. I was saying all along not to give up on Michael Rasmussen as center. I think he has it in him. And I, I think, think he, he is a, a, I mean, dare I say a prototype fourth line center. Like he yeah. is exactly what you want out of a, out of a fourth line center. And that's, what, he, that's what he will be, uh, you know, at the beginning of the season, at least. It almost seems like sometimes, and there's not a lot of pressure right now. And this could just be like my bias towards Michael Rasmussen. I almost feel as if like he plays better with more pressure on him. Like you talk about when injuries happened the last two seasons and he was forced into a role that he probably most people would argue he wasn't prepared for, but that's where he shined. Like going down the stretch this last season, you know, he played a little bit of wing and he played a little bit of center. It was about a 50, 50 split those last 20 games. And he played well through injury because he had an increased role the year before that he was forced into the one C role after Larkin got hurt two years ago, like near the end of the season. And he looked, he played fine. He held with the big boys. It's almost like Michael Rasmussen's better. The more responsibility he has, which is really weird and backwards. But like, and I'm not trying to campaign like, oh, Michael Rasmussen should be the one C or even the two C. But it's just it's interesting something I I feel like I've noticed. I could be completely wrong, <laughs> but again, and it's preseason. But like, I I I really want Michael Rasmussen to see, succeed because he's got a like with his size. I mean, he could be a real weapon, especially out in front of the net. But yeah, that you know. that's why I really like him for that four C role. And honestly, I, I think if the preseason ended today and and you know regular season was tonight. I think we're we're looking at Michael Rasmussen as the fourth line center. Well, and then so Philip Zadina and John, Jonathan Bergeron also played uh, well as well in that game. Philip Zadina has just been really good. Obviously, I no can't wait for, for the regular him. season, man. Uh, but he's been know, all like, over the place. Like I, I can't wait for the regular season just because, like you know, that then we'd be really back. But for him, like he is maybe the biggest reason I can't wait for the regular oh, yeah. season. I I, I really want to see if this high motor, fast pace, just looking great and sharp style of play that we've seen from Zadina since the team reconvened carries over into the regular season. Cause he, he continues to look great. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, when we come back, we're going to move on to the most recent game that happened a three to nothing shutout of the Chicago Blackhawks at the United center in Chicago. The numbers don't lie in the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen simple, safe home security to protect their home. You don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. At Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. They protect you with cutting-edge security technology powered by 24-7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back. 
Here is why you would love it. With 24-7 professional monitoring, Simple Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in, in an emergency, even if you're not home or can't be reached. Simple Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. HD security cameras for inside and outside your home, smarter ways to detect motion that alert you to a threat if a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that instant, instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. Our, their monitoring experts use propi- proprietary advanced response technology to visually confirm when a break-in is real, so you can get the highest priority police dispatch. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplesafe.com slash locked on NHL. Save 20% on your Simplisafe security system when you sign up for an interface monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplesafe.com slash NHL locked on NHL to learn more. There's no safe like Simplisafe. Segment two locked on Red Wings podcast. We're going to move on now to talking to the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, game that happened on Saturday night and uh game that was only broadcast on NHL network, which kind of stinks to be honest. I wish, I wish just a little, get something off my chest. I wish every preseason game was aired on Bally sports or like on a local channel. I know that the NHL is like down there in terms of the four major sports. So you're not going to get every game broadcast like a NFL. I mean, I know MLB doesn't even do that. But it just really stinks when you have no solid way of watching it unless you have like a really expensive cable package because it was only on NHL Network. So it stinks. Like, you want it's hard to grow the game when you don't even broadcast every single game. But I get it's just preseason, but that's just, you know, I'll get off my soapbox now. I'm with you on that. It's just just hard to watch. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And and it's crazy because like baseball and hockey are comfortably the two worst at it. (laughs) <laughs> right like like the nfl you're always going to get the games in your market and like if you just do whatever like sunday does, ticket you just get like the whole package with everything and then the nba air all their preseason games nba mm, preseason is something i don't want to speak on and, and be like you know wrong about but i mean if you don't know just say you don't know yeah I don't, no i don't but i i the nba is like the best at their media because mm. they're the only one that they're like yeah share all of our highlights everybody like everybody has rights to our highlights everybody just you know tweet our highlights you know live stream games whatever you want to do do it have fun and that's how they've you know grown so much in the last whatever 20 30 years whereas every other sport is so i mean baseball has a million different you know, packages and, and streaming services you got to watch stuff on. And yeah, uh, clearly this was kind of there, but just the preseason, like you said, and uh, we'll be back to, to Ken and Mick on Bally soon enough. Yeah, not soon enough, <laughs> but soon enough. We got two well, more weeks to make it through. Soon enough. So, so the game against, you know what? The game, they won three, nothing. It's great. The main question from this game, is Lucas Raymond about to have a breakout season? Is he about, and he had 57 points last year, which is a phenomenal year for a rookie playing on top line on a team that finished bottom 10 in the league. And he finished fourth in Calder voting. He played great last year, but is he really going to break out this season? Because, and again, it was a preseason game and I understand that. And so the Chicago Blackhawks didn't have all their best players out, out there playing against their Detroit Red Wings, but Lucas Raymond absolutely took over that game. Absolutely took over that game. Every single time he touched the puck, he was making something happen. They could not get the puck off his stick to save his life. The amount of smart plays he was doing in the offensive zone and the amount of pockets he was picking to take over the puck. I mean, the the first goal that Verona scored was because Lucas Raymond picked the pocket and it maintained possession of the puck through like two guys to feed Jacob Verona. It, It looked, and people pointed it out on Twitter, it looked like Datsuk feeding Brett Hall back in 2002. With the way that Jacob Verona just stayed in his spot in the wheelhouse in 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 the circle, and Lucas Raymond made four or five moves to get free, make that pass across for the first goal to finally break that shutout. And then, of course, he had a goal for uh, of his own and another assist on the Dylan Larkin goal. I mean, he was everywhere doing everything. Is this going to be a breakout year for him? I think he's going to have a great year. Uh, the word Stay breakout. Yes. No, no, no. The word breakout is just weird to me. Like. Breakout from like a top five 
cult. Like he's only this is only he's only had one year. Like breakout from, I don't know. Breakout to me is like maybe it's just maybe this is just like really nitpicky and like in my brain the definition of breakout isn't like the same as yours. But like breakout to me is somebody who has had multiple seasons under your belt under their belt. And you're like, oh, like the, you know, the stars are aligning. This is the year they're going to put it all together and, and, you know, double their point total this year. And they're just going to be absolutely insane and like get a lot more of an opportunity and whatnot. I don't really know if I would call, like, I expect him to have a fantastic year. I expect him to be productive in the top line. I think he's going to take a huge step forward. I guess that's how I'd word it is like, this is going to be another sizable step forward i think that's a very real possibility but i don't know like break break out like i don't know break out from what like he, he was a t- you know top four calder finisher last year and was a top line as a rookie like literally like two weeks into the season till the end of the year was was on our top line i don't know if i'd call it like so a, a breakout i think people what, know i think people know that he's like about to be nice so what it sounds like you're saying is that it's not going to be a breakout year because to break out, you would have to have lower expectations than you already sure. do. Sure. Yeah. So no, in your, in your program. mindset, this, this is expected from Lucas Raymond. You're expecting this step forward from him. Yeah. I mean, if, if, look, if, if he looks like he did on Saturday in Chicago every night, that's good. That's a whole different thing. I mean, that, that would be, um, he looked unbelievable. He looks like the best player on the ice. So, I mean, if he does that, I mean, expected season, goals four percentage is 83%. Right. Like that's even, that's even surpasses my expectations, but I think, yeah, I, I think I expect him to take a, a decent step forward from where he already was. And I think that the players around him now make that significantly easier, just the depth of the team. It makes it easier to break out the support system around you. I just use the phrase breakout, but I guess there you go. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, I know it's what you're just, talking it, about. Yeah. I, I, right. I, I think he's, uh, I think he is in a great position and, and is poised to really take another step forward. And I expect him to do so. Yeah. And like in the back of my mind, I've been really afraid of that, 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 that feared, yeah, the sophomore, sophomore slump, slump yeah. from both him and Cider. Like, not that they'd be bad, but like you'd see a little bit of a step back in their production and their effectiveness. Yeah, I, but I wasn't so even far, really, right? For me personally, I wasn't even really worried for like step back. I was just, I don't know if we get the exact same from them. I would almost be kind of yeah. let down by that. And that's not really fair on them, but they just gave off so much their rookie year. And we expect so much of them as a fan base. And we're really kind of building this thing around a core that involves the two of them. So, yeah, I, I think that, you know, almost having the exact, you know, it's a lot harder with, with defensemen. It's a lot harder to really talk about what Siders productive would be just from a numbers standpoint or like a baseline stat standpoint. But for Raymond, you know, if you're, if you're looking at point totals, I, yeah, I almost would have looked at like, you know, around the same point total as last year in that like mid fifties range as kind of like, okay, like, you know, maybe we'll wait till next year to take the big step forward. But um, it's games like that where you kind of, it's impossible to really contain your excitement and you just watch him and you're like, okay, like he looked regular season ready. Like I, like I said, he literally looks like the best player on the ice on Saturday. Oh, easily. It wasn't even particularly close. Yeah. And we'll talk about Vrana and Larkin as well. His line mates in that game. uh, When we come back uh, as well as a few other players uh, that, Stood out to me, Jonathan Berggren, uh, Cross Hannes played really well as well in my uh, eyes. Of course, more at Cider. So we'll get yep. to those guys uh, when we come back. Locked on Red Wings, segment three, Monday edition. I said that backwards. I'm supposed to say segment three, Locked on Red Wings, but, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, yes, Scotty, along with Lucas Raymond, Dylan Larkin, and Jacob Vrana, I thought, played really well as well. But honestly, I, I feel like Larkin benefited and this isn't a slight against Larkin it's not I don't want it to sound it's gonna sound a little bit like it but I think Larkin benefited more from Raymond than Raymond benefited from Larkin like Raymond was that's the thing is he had three points in that game a goal and two assists and he set up Larkin for so many opportunities including his you know, obviously his goal but he set up Verona too I mean if you look at per, per possession wise and shot attempts wise Verona was the best player on the team I mean there were if you look at Corsi alone so shot attempts alone not even factoring in quality there was 12 shot attempts for by the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, he was on the ice and only two shot attempts against when Verano was on the ice. 
Verano was so effective on both sides of the ice, the Blackhawks, and the Blackhawks struggled to get shots all game long. The Red Wings are absolutely stifling them. But, I mean, the fact that the shooting, the shots for percentage was 90% in favor of the Detroit Red Wings when he was on the ice is pretty promising. And, of course, he had a goal. I mean, he was in the right place at the right time. He obviously had good chemistry with Raymond. He's so a finisher, kind of, man. Dude, I mean, he's with, with, with Bertuzzi out as long as he's been. And, you know, a little unspoken said he's going to be back any day now, which is great to hear. But with Bertuzzi out, it's really given other players opportunities to play on that top line. And Verona's making a case that we, we know Bertuzzi can produce on line two. And if he has that phenomenal chemistry, and we saw that chemistry with Zidina as well, so that's something to keep in mind. But if he has that insane chemistry with Raymond and Larkin, and if Raymond's like more of the playmaker, and he can set up Verana. And Verana can be Thule, too. He can be a good playmaker. I mean, those three could have insane chemistry. Again, preseason game. But there's so much potential in matchups with this top six. I would even argue the top nine in terms of effectiveness on how this chemistry could work. I mean, that top line was really exciting to watch because they dominated out there, man. They were absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, and that's why preseason's fun to me. Like, you know, everybody always talks about uh, like, oh, I don't know how you can get excited for preseason or, you know, like spring training in baseball or, or whatnot. And it's like, mm, th this is why, because we get to see a million different line combinations and get to play this game where we go through and just talk about all the different possibilities of lines that, that we could see going forward and going into the regular season. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think they are just most, I don't, worried's not the right word, but their highest priority for Verona right now, I think, is just like let's just get this dude through a full season, like for the love of everything. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that before they turn around and go, okay, like let's start giving them regular season looks at the top line ahead of Bird or anything. I, I think for now they're more of just like, hey, where is he most comfortable so that he can play 82 games <laughs> like like I, I think that that's probably like the biggest thing but again like injuries are gonna happen it's it's inevitable oh, yeah. it's impossible to go through 82 and be completely healthy so being able to play this this kind of mix and match game now will help us when the injuries inevitably do happen hopefully all minor and are all you know smaller and only a whatever a couple of games or a week and and whatnot but that allows us to know, like, hey, back, you know, in October, this was something that looked really good, maybe. Or, you know, Verona gets looked at the power play more, and then he's playing with, you know, more top-line guys. Like, there's so many different conversations to be had there, and I, I love versatility in sports. And so, just, I mean, I love it. And the lines were mixed and matched throughout the game, sure, yeah. precisely to what you were talking about, like injuries are going to happen, so different things are going to happen. So, like, Joe Valeno did center Verona, and – uh, Raymond for seven minutes of that game and Valeno played great too. He had the second best expected goals for percentage on the team and the second best expected goals for relative. I mean, it was obviously he's playing with two top line caliber players. Like even if Ron is playing on the second line, he's borderline top line caliber player. I mean, being centering between those two is going to help a lot, but his relative was the second best in the team. So that speaks to the fact that he was having an offensive impact as well. So, I mean, he yeah. further, he further cements himself as like a center on this team. And like all of a sudden, man, their center drops a looking a lot stronger than it did. Just the acquisition of Andrew Kopp, who hasn't played yet. I mean, now you, up and down the middle, like I do, to be honest, like, I it's don't know deeper, if Q going to have a role. It, well, it, it's deeper than it was for sure. But I, I mean, it's still, I, yeah, it's still one significant injury this time away from not being deep like it's it's deep until it's not and it's it's i think it's only still kind of a player away from being de it's deeper in the sense that you might go into the regular season with four dudes you feel confident at at center which is great and something we haven't had in literally years so like dope i'm really pumped about it but i, I don't know if i'm ready to to call you know deeper than it was is not impressive that's a very that's true I, mean, that's jump. I think and that's like, still far way away from being deep i understand also that i'm very starry-eyed right now because they played really well in that preseason game and again it's a preseason game so i understand that like i'm kind of just probably a little bit too excited over a game that in the end doesn't matter but like i'm sorry like 
No, let it He played ride, well. Baby. I'm excited about it. Let it, it like, ride. You're seeing best case scenarios from these players in that game. Like if they play, and obviously best case scenario is hard to live up to. But well, over 82, it sure is. Over 82, yeah. but I mean, if that's how well they can play, if that's their ceiling that we just witnessed, I mean, to talk about another guy, obviously, so P- the line of Pontus Andreasen, Jonathan Bergeron, and Cross Hannes, you know, they were out there for more shots against than they were for shots for in a game where they really heavily outshot. But they showed flashes as well. There was a couple of really good passing plays between Bergeron and Hannes that I was like, wow. Like, this is the creativity out of it. And they're young, and so that's why they make these mistakes, and that's why they were out there for more shots against and shots for, because they're not, like, veterans in the NHL. Like, these, the other guys we were talking about are at this point. But they showed moments, like, in the third period. I think maybe it might have been the second, where there's a passing play between Bergen and Hannes where they were just confusing the hell out of the Blackhawks in the offensive zone and were this close to putting burying that puck. Cross Hannes just barely missed the net. And... I mean, they're young yet. Bergen's closer to the NHL than Hannes is, but Hannes looks like a bona fide NHLer in the making. I don't really know what's going on, on with Andreasen. I don't really know what the plan is for him. But, I mean, that line showed some flashes of creativity as well. There was a lot to love. And then, of course, Moritz Sider. Just stud. Unreal. Yeah, no, he, he looks unbelievable. Um, I don't even know if there's too much else to say. Like, he's just looked incredible in every preseason game he's played in and has looked probably uh actually like the best player on the ice pretty much in every game so far which is a really good sign his skating is unbelievable for how big he is and for being a defenseman um hannis is is one of the i I, i'm trying to find another way to word it besides saying like he's one of the biggest storylines of the preseason because like we have as a and we have Zadina and whatnot. Like I, you know, he he's not he, he's not in that like category of magnitude at least. But just as in, in the sense of you know turning heads and people kind of circling his name on their on their roster sheets. You know what I mean? Like he's, I think he's really starting to do that. He he has looked really good. We talked about it. Oh, oh I mean, we've talked about it all of camp. We talked about it in camp. We talked about it in red and white. Like we talked about it in prospects, like he is is somebody that really is starting to to turn heads, and and I think people are becoming more and more impressed with him, and I'm really excited about um, what his development this year is going to be because I think he could go from a guy who was almost like dare I say off the radar <laughs> of like future plans and oh, for yeah. most people into the conversation of like hey let's start a dialogue about like except. What- What's going to happen in the future with him? Except for our one listener who kept commenting in the YouTube post being like, dude, talk about Cross Hannes. He's great. He's undersold. Yeah, He's undersold. Out. He was right. Shout um, out. I think that was Nick, if I'm remembering correctly, because Cross Hannes has been nothing but impressive since I've seen him at the start of yeah. development camp and everything. Um, I, I, I just for fun. There's two more things I really briefly wanted to get to. One was just obviously you're listening to the Chicago broadcast. If you're watching on NHL Network. But the hilarity with the fact that every time somebody took a run at Moritz Sider, Moritz Sider, they were like, oh, they're going after Sider. They're they're big hit on Sider. And I remember one particular time where they're like, big hit on Sider. And like they showed the replay and they were talking about it like they laid Sider out. They ran into Sider and they fell first. And Moritz Sider went down to like one knee. Like Moritz Sider took less of the brunt of that hit than the guy who tried. Like, they kept trying to take runs at Sider. a couple of reversals, too, and the mm-hmm. announcers were like, they're just trying to bully Sider. And it's like, well, they're not. So. And, like, and that's the thing. is like, we're so blessed in, in Detroit with our both Ken Cal and Ken Daniels and Mickey Redman and Paul Woods, radio and television-wise. Yeah. They'll call a spade a spade. Like, yeah, is there a little bit of bias towards Redman? Well, of course. But, like, the fact that when there's something they do something wrong or they do something bad, they're not just like, oh, big hit. Like, I love the fact that if someone tried to hit, if if Ken, if Mickey Redman was calling this game and let's say Chris Kulo, who is on the smaller side, tried to take a run at a guy and just got laid out in the process, he'd be like, oh, don't know if you want to go after that guy. He would call it a spade a spade. I just, you really take, you really appreciate our broadcasters for not just trying to pull the wool over your eyes on stuff like that. Cause more Sutter was not being bullied. People were trying because people were trying to make a name for themselves. Everyone wants to be the guy who lays out the rookie of the year, but Absolutely. like it was not working. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. 
And then the one other thing I wanted to talk about is because, and this is just popped in my head because I was looking at stats. If you go to all game long or all episode long, I've been talking about stats at five on five. I may not have said it, but like all the course C4 expected goals for a percentage, that was all at five on five. I switched it to all, filtered it to all, all situations. And I looked at just strictly expected goals for. Because I was curious, because the Red Wings dominated, but the goaltender for the Blackhawks, Stalock, I think his name is. I'm trying to remember exactly how it's pronounced. Yeah, Stalock. He played great all game long to the point where there were one, two, three, four, five Red Wings with an expected goals four percentage over one. It was so, nil nil after two. Yeah. And based, and they already had over 30 shots based on how yeah. the certain Red Wings played. Albert Johansson, Jordan Osterley, Jacob Vrana, Dylan Larkin, and Lucas Raymond, who those last three all had goals, but all expected goals for over one in this game. Yeah, shout That's out how Ray. well they were playing against Stalock and how well Stalock was shutting them down. For that sure. they had expected goals for. Albert Johansson had expected goals for of one and a half, and he didn't get a single goal, not even a single point. That's crazy to me. Like, that's great. It is. Great. No, it is. That, that, that was... I remember, I think that was the game we were texting during, and you were like, they yeah. look really good. And it was 0 0. And we were like, we look really good. And I'm like, yeah, we just can't score. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> everything else looks fantastic. Yeah. But and that's, I just wanted to mention that because that's crazy to me that there were five, like, by expected goals for alone, by quality of shot attempt taken, the Red Wings should have had five goals in this game, and they only had three. That's how good Stalic was playing. And they need to buy that man a dinner because he played you know, unreal. Um, oh, we didn't even mention Kosta and Nadalkovich looked good. Didn't let a single goal in. 14 saves for Nadalkovich after two periods and seven saves for Kosta in one. Absolutely. Good. Love, love to see it. Uh, any final thoughts? We ball. We do ball. I will be back with you guys tomorrow. Same time, same place. See your team every day. Every day. I was waiting for you to say bet online, and I remember we didn't do bet online. Today, yeah. We didn't have a bet online. Hmm. Disappointing.